using this like HTML slide. Sure, but you can put it into the, the marketplace or our Android 
Firefox users right now. The Firefox users on Android is not a big market share, but it's 10 million. And I can tell you, it was less than a million in June. So it's climbing up. It's going to be, I think, Android, Firefox, and Android is going to be a big
to a desktop more apps looking for my app. There it is. There's hacker views and I put a little icon there. That's part of the map. Now watch it. And there it is, there's my app. And this is the same interaction design that you would work on the phone. Actually, the token that has a phone on it, so afterwards we're talking to the demo part, but you can show you that. And I also have a special one that I just want to play Android phone. I'll show you how that works as well. So we get out of the app. <coughs> Of course, it runs super smooth because it's on a Mac. The idea is to get that nice smooth movement on the phone. Pretty close. Games. I think it's loading. It's not a very good way to Not a good one. That's our Firefox OS simulator. And one of the cool things that we're working on is we have a JavaScript developer in Firefox, the desktop. And there's another remote button. I don't have a very good demo of this right now. But you would be able to get blocking messages from the OS simulator right into your Firefox dev tools. You would be able to debug JavaScript separate from the software things uh, as well using this environment. So you can go back and forth to the simulator. And that's how hard talks and do your development. And I can just shut it down. And so another app thing here is you can have a whole list of apps that you're working on, and you just add them to the page, and when you make the app, you can just copy it. So this tool is it's just making it as an add-on for Firefox. It's a pretty big one, so it's a big one. But uh, it's a, for, so it has the simulator embedded into it. But it looks pretty well. Okay. So that's the demo. And any questions about this? So, uh, what? Two uh, questions. One, the Echo Zoom. This one, uh, number two is, uh, what's the difference, okay, uh, will there be difference between uh, the one of API that the phone actually has, we can have API that the phone has that we can have on the desktop. Let's see if I get in. Oh, sorry, what was the first question again? The Apple Zoom. Will Apple sue us? Um, no, I don't think so. That just isn't the best. <laughs> will Samsung sue us? So it will be really bitter from losing the Apple judgments or whatever. <laughs> so the, the question from number two is because we've got a device API for Final 5. Yes. How much of the of that API actually gets exposed to the desktop uh, simulator? So there are a bunch of APIs that will be on the phone, things like the dialer okay. and whatnot. That I think the plan is, I'm not sure if it works right now, the plan is to stub those out and have visual cues for when they work. So for example, if you your app vibrates the phone, uh, there's nothing you can do there on the desktop. But maybe we would have a visual cue. I, I think the, the iOS simulator does this as well. And this is our linear model for it. So we would have indication um, of some way of, of indicating like, you know, you use the SMS to let the API or whatever the heck it is. And that works. And so there's, there's a bunch of HTML5 APIs that work because the simulator is really just using, it's using Firefox in order to emulate this. Um, so things like geolocation, index PD, um, all the standard HTML5 stuff there. And then the idea is that all the really sort of newer phone specific stuff like telephony, SMS, vibration, um, they would have visual cues to this case, so you can verify that things work. Um, uh, another question? So, yeah. Uh, the, this manifest stuff, um, that's the 
it's, is it the same as your your uh, add-ons, or is it something new? Or um, so I'm, but basically, my thought, uh, which I'm quite, not very clearly uh, coming up with, is um, is I'm quite familiar with making apps on the on uh, on iOS. You know, adding to the home screen. Um, I've even got the app. Uh, I've even worked out how to use AppCache for a couple of my apps. And it, and it all kind of works, and you know, there's the Apple thing for having a splash screen and things like that as the pages look. So I'm just wondering, like, is it going to work the same way here, or is it going to be different? Um, it's going to be relatively simple. So this is the docs on the developer website. And um, it's just a JSON file, and this is a very simple version of it. Mm. Well, um, why, why can't it like use the Apple icon stanza and description thing? And well, it's, what this is actually very close to is the Chrome Web Store app, <laughs> and we're discussing what's going to happen to standardize them so that we can move forward. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make more sense to align with the way web apps are done on iOS, or am I the only one that does Apple? Am I am I a Minority who does web apps on iOS. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I think that we needed uh, a little bit more out of it, and that uh, you know the iOS system is not a web standard. Well, so yeah. It's not, it's not to see web standards or the uh, neither, the, neither is this one. No, because it's on the track. But so what we do, what we do with our with our browser and other partners. Not that bad, but it's it's bad. It's it's kind of okay. Oh, the other comment I had is that um, I would I would um, um, I would be incentivized to put a few of my apps onto the, the marketplace if if you had really nice icons and artwork to give away. Okay. That was just my comment. Like you would provide you with artwork. Yeah, or just have you know like in some um, I don't know. I'm sure that you know you have these gaming. Uh, Studios where they have all these icons, you can just mix and match and so, and make up your own stuff. Oh, okay. Um, so you could provide that support. Right. Just a, just an, an idea. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise m things might look a bit crap. Yeah. Um, standard across what a web app or iOS Yeah. Good. Um, but, and honestly, yeah. like I code, but I'm really bad at graphics. Is if anyone. If you had a graphics guy, you could sort of work with me to get some of my apps on there. I'd be, I would do it. Otherwise, I was like, I don't want to do it because it makes my, my app look crap on your platform or something like that. So what do you do for iOS? Just write a couple of apps. It's just a just a couple of things to I can show you later. Right. But what do you do with your iPhone? Uh. Well, I have crap ones. Um, <laughs> so so um, in terms of icons and, and graphic resources. It's hard to do that with people, right? Like I'm saying, um, we'll write your own icons. But one, one of the things in the in the pipe in terms of <laughs> standardizing how web apps look on Firefox and webs, um, <clears throat> and we want to kind of be careful because the web is the platform we want to let people you know build stuff that's going to work on more than just the phone. But there are going to be those components that are shipping things like you know, sliders and select boxes and a lot of the stuff you get in iOS when you're using code, oh. right? I was going to say that the, the new Bootstrap thing, the Ratchet, does that work well? I mean, it does. Well, all of those, all of those, like kind of responsive Bootstrap things, okay. you can drop in and use those. But there is also sort of a, 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 a Firefox OS feel, like it's a, a sandstone or dia, whatever it's called. Okay. <laughs> that kind of, the kind of feel that a lot of the apps on Firefox OS had. You want to get into that CSS. A lot of these web components. That we're using for generalized apps that will have you know like list selectors and maps and all these sorts of things that will 
HTML tags you can throw in, but we style them in front. So the idea is that if you're a totally crap designer, you can't, you know, if you're a developer, you can do this and kind of get the stuff that's built in, or just use something like Bootstrap, right? Um, but yeah. it is still the mobile web, so you have to be really cognizant of that stuff. Like I'm using jQuery mobile for my for my demo. Wow. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do that because jQuery mobile is is uh, is a really interesting library, but it's a bit slow. And there's a lot of uh, real interest in you know, you have a, a really slow phone that and that's the mass market we're going for. You're absolutely performing. Do it. And and so throwing a desktop library at it, especially a desktop library that's meant to be compatible with IE6 and runs a bunch of extra code because of that compatibility there is a necessary thing. I, I ran uh, I, I did my demo in jQuery mobile because it was really easy to do. In fact, it was just a JS build that I found. And and D, because it looks terrible, and I know that you're absolutely better. So and there's all sorts of amazing, amazing stuff that you can find that's people working really hard on web development frameworks all the time that's gonna that you can leverage it to make them more flexible. This is why we think that this is gonna win because there are so many web developers out there around the world. And there's only so many highways involved. I think there's hundreds of thousands of miles involved with the millions and millions of you win. Or Brendan Ike said, Brendan Ike is the inventor of JS, the CTO, it's always bet on JS. But I, I expand that I've bet on that. So that wouldn't have steered me wrong with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so uh, um, it seems like it's religion to us inside Mozilla what's going on with Quantum Firefox at this, but I'm sure that it's perfectly normal for ordinary people not to it. So, uh, we are launching Firefox OS with partner Telefonica, and they're a uh, their carrier in Brazil and Vivo. And so there will be a Firefox OS phone marketed in Brazil on Vivo. Uh, middle of next year? It's first half of next year. First half of next year. So that's the initial uh, that's the initial partner and the initial market. And I think that there are, are I can say confidently there will be several other markets in South America that will along with that. And then uh, we're looking at Eastern Europe as well. So I haven't heard of uh, anything coming together for the Asian and really, it, there's two things there about that. Uh, we haven't found the right partner to go with the thing. And I don't think we're actually pursuing one right now because we're just really focused on shipping a little bit. So we're, we're, that's something about us. Oh, okay. So, um, I was on a plane for three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, does that explodify if we are talking about carriers in China? There's a lot of interests. Um, we don't have phones, like hardware. Necessarily, for every market, we are talking to some of the bigger carriers. Uh, I know China, I heard Indonesia as well. There's nothing that's not official. Uh, there's a huge amount of interest, uh, preliminary interest in carriers, um, pretty much everywhere in the world, including North America. Uh, so, we have the one for the future of the world, and so South America I think is an app for us, but probably in the next. 18 months, it's going to get a really long window. So we'll start rolling out uh, at least the V2 one. So the other thing to think about is that in the meantime, there will be millions and millions and millions of Android phones shipped. And our hmm. for Android will be millions and millions of millions of users. And the same web app will run the same way. And, and the, uh, in the operating system is an open source, you can actually an Android phone with it. Yeah. Well, it's not easy. It's yeah. not easy. I, I, it's my personal wish that we get a bunch of hardware hackers and make it much easier and more widespread to put the hardware on But uh, And I think that that's where us being a, a much more used to working in open source and, and being open source from sort of day one of this project is helpful. Do you have another question? Are there any other questions? How about that?
you first. Okay, uh, I, I, I'm getting the API docs right now. Okay. Uh, some of the API is very nifty. Charging, uh -huh. the char battery status is very nifty. Really good up for desktop or laptop for this guy. So with that, with that can actually make this use outside the phone itself. For example, the battery, uh, for some of the hardware related API, right. will there actually be plans to actually make this a standard so that other browsers can use this beyond just the phone itself? So, so everything we do, we put the standard track. Okay. Standard track is agency. Oh, yeah. um, unfortunately. But uh, all of these web APIs, these device APIs that we're working on, they are meant to be web standards. So, can I use it on my laptop in the future, for example? Well, so that would be interesting implementing a battery status for a laptop. Actually, um, that, but, uh, no, no, the battery API works on the desktop. Really? Oh, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Okay, I just haven't thought of that. Yeah, my, that's my understanding. I was talking with the guy and guys a while ago, and I believe that the battery status works. Because a lot of the APIs work on Android and yeah. Firefox OS, but then like the desktop, not so much. Pretty sure the battery is one of them. Right. So. On the other hand, it's ACT, uh, ACTI and the Mahmoud Music, so that's the that I can make this on the field. Well, it's just okay. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, are you um, I think that the, the hardware partner for system on chip is all That's fine. So that's a, that's our focus right now. I have no idea. Maybe I mean I've heard of X X eighty six plans for Firefox and Android as well as to do phones and other tablets. Uh, they're pretty good, but uh, ARM seems to be really really popular. Yeah, I read an article recently that said Intel is considering making really battery efficient x86 processors in the coming three years. They might have something on the market. So I think if you're doing mobile, then got ARM is pretty solid. Yeah. With this Microsoft going to ARM, that's quite common. I mean, this, the simulator runs, is running on Intel, right? So, yeah. Firefox OS will compile and run on Intel machines. That's what the simulator is. It's not simulating architecture, I understand. It's running the code. Uh, yeah, it's just a, mm. a hacked up build of Firefox that runs in that. Yeah, so I mean, it could run on an Intel machine. Yep. Anyway, um, um, one more question. One more question. <laughs> yeah, I um, um, understand that Firefox OS is meant to run on ARM chip. Yep. Uh, we run on a Raspberry Pi. It, it has the port of Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I read that somewhere, but I yeah. haven't been able to find the link to download it and try it out. Um, there was one guy that did that and posted to YouTube, and, and it was awesome. Uh -huh. I was actually, I think I saw that and I tweeted it, and it was like my most retweeted. Yeah. I'm not Christian Pablo, I'm not a Twitter. Right. Yeah, I kind of saw the video too, so um, of course I, I'm with the Raspberry Pi community in Singapore. So oh, yeah. we were looking for, you know, cool stuff they can install on the Raspberry Pi. I mean, the guys here, you guys know what a Raspberry Pi is? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's a credit card size mini computer, so it's just pretty cool stuff. So, I mean, we, we try to find some different, different kind of distros that can run on it. Um, Firefox OS is one of those that we hope to be able to try and run on, on the Raspberry Pi. Maybe do some fun stuff on it, I don't know. I'll see if I can get some of the documents. Yeah, I mean, the, the video is cool, but I don't want to go to the steps and give it a try. Right? Yeah, I can feel like this is the first video that you probably Yeah. And there's a YouTube video, but it's probably not. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. I was going to. Okay. But yeah, it was, that was the most successful thing ever. It's just to see. Also, something that I'm going to do here is the N9 is still on $800. Cool. Um, so that's, that's the end of my talk, but we're going to be hanging out later. If you have more questions, just let me know. Um, thank you. <laughs>
The only thing is, there's no way to get the help to the... ...into the... ...into the home screen. Mm -hmm. I have it running on my. I just downloaded it just now. All oh, right, you you got the add-on. Yeah, install. no, it's not an add-on. It's an emulator. Oh, it right. runs on my desktop. I was, the next question I was going to ask is: Is what is the maps app properly that I have? Maps app. They use Nokia maps. Oh. Yeah, you can see here copyright Nokia. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Does it do turn by turn? Uh, not yet. I haven't tried out anything. Well, yeah, it does. It does turn by turn. You can have a Well, problem. you have to put it in things. Yeah. I hope it works just for just for um, oh, yeah. so, yeah. I'm not sure if I want this. <laughs> the only problem is I cannot get back to the home screen. <laughs> no longer only eating tofu, but I, yeah, I'm going to that. Uh, so Jeff is here, and Jeff, Jeff's talking about you know building apps, building up web apps, and, and how you do apps and stuff like that. Um, a lot of people, when they demo building web apps, do like the to-do app or the RSS reader app, you know, the app for news reader, whatever like that. Um, that's all well and good, but it's a little boring. Like, I don't need 20 million beers and to do apps and all that kind of stuff on my phone. Um, I'm not actually a big gamer anymore, but if you want to get people excited about doing stuff, it's building games. And, like, when you're a kid and you play video games, you're like, that's what I want to do. And it turns out that kind of development is really hard, and in the web, it's been almost impossible. Um, but it's really exciting, and the most interesting part is it's a huge market. Go on to the iOS app store and you want to know what's selling big there, what's making a lot of people a lot of money there. Like, look at Angry Birds. You can't go five you know, <laughs> seconds on the street or something like walking by a stall and have, like an Angry Birds hat. And half that shit is probably unlicensed, but still, even if half of it is licensed, that's a lot of money, right? People really care about games. So, I want to talk to you guys about building web app games very specifically. I don't want to talk about to do apps, I don't want to talk about what you can do when you Text your friend from Firefox OS phone. I don't care about any of that. I want to build really fun, exciting games for the web. Um, a lot of that write once, run anywhere stuff. Like we've heard that with Java. Uh, if you guys are old enough for that, and you know you're hearing how they shit out, right? Even web apps like mm. 10 years ago, it's like five years ago. You could write this in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Good, it's same that Yeah, not like that's never really going to be a reality. But mm. games, it kind of is. Games is actually the one place where if you play a game on Windows and Mac and your Xbox and your Nintendo, like UIs of games are more specific to the game than the platform. If you play a game on the Xbox or the PlayStation, it actually is like, entirely the same because a game can have its own UI, its own control pair. All of that stuff is specific to the game, not to what platform you're writing on. So in this one particular instance, you can actually write once and run anywhere. 
utilization of live games. Obviously, you want to do touch events on a phone, you want to do keyboard and mouse controls on a computer, or gamepad controls. But this is kind of the one place you can do it. So I want to talk about why making games for the web doesn't have to be scary anymore. Because I don't know if you've ever read the blogs about the guy who built Mario with a bunch of div tags, you know, did like really hacky stuff. That's not where we're at anymore. It used to be five years ago, you could like bring up some flash and play some noises because there was no audio <coughs> API. And you could make like Mario a series of spans, and then you would run and you would check the state with like set time mode, and it was awful. That's not where it is anymore. So, like I said, I'm talking about that. Um, I work on the web development team. Uh, we made these really cool shirts, which are clients. This is actually the Firefox logo. And then if you type this code in, it will output this with colors and everything. So yeah, we love JavaScript. Um, let's get away from this. <laughs> and move towards stuff like this. Uh, I live in Montreal, Canada. And this is our underground subway system. And someone made a Mario 3 drawing of it. Um, so I bought a poster of it. And it's in my uh, apartment. So when people are at my apartment at like 1 a.m., like we've been drinking, we have, oh crap, how do I get home? Which stuff I stopped picking off of? It looked like this. Um, so writing games also used to be really styled off. This is another exciting thing about mobile web technology and web developers and talking about how we have these millions of developers rather than hundreds of thousands of iOS guys. Um, tons of people know JavaScript. And I'm here to tell you that now to write a game, the only thing you need to know is JavaScript. You don't even really need to know HTML and CSS. And one of those people who's like, CSS really wakes me out because there's all these odd things about it. You just need to know JavaScript. Um, Canvas, JavaScript, and even with Montreal, you can do game. And these things work on phones, and they work on desktops, and everything. You don't need a lot of stuff to get started. You see that games are going to buy one of those like, Nintendo development kits and sign a license agreement. And now you just go to GitHub and you get some game template. And you don't think you have to do is scrap it, which I guess you know, we need more pre rendered game graphics or something. Like that. Yeah. Um, so, Mozilla thought of this, right? Like when we were building Firefox OS, and even when Chrome was starting to do that Chrome Web App Store, there was Angry Birds there. And everyone noticed that if you just went to you know, like chrome.angrybirds.com and spoofed your browser, it worked fine in Firefox. Um, that web gaming was going to be this real thing. It's going to be a competitive advantage for Firefox. Um, it was something people do. Like, you go to Facebook and all these Zynga games and whatever, and I kind of think they're evil. But um, <laughs> people spend a lot of time doing it. Um, it's really exciting and important. So instead of just saying, we're going to build a browser that lets you build games, we actually have people who work at Mozilla pretty much full time on doing game libraries. So there's something very creatively called Web Game Stub, because programmers think up really exciting names. But Mozilla has this thing called Web Game Stub, which is a 2D game engine that comes pre-built with like collision detection and input controls and you know a, a loop and everything, and it's packaged in with our kind of generic mortar, which is, is this general web app template. This game stuff is added on top of it, and it's something we ship up to developers to let them get started hacking game code. Really, so I think the biggest barrier to entry is not knowing where to start. Um, so. That's what we do. We load it up with tons of useful stuff. Um, the per frame animation loop is really important. We now have this API in the browser. We can actually draw something at the fastest whatever machine you're on can draw it, hopefully that's 60 frames a second. But it's intelligent enough to like skip up frames so that things perform well. Um, and you know you, you, you can cut a couple of frames like any game engine does. Um, but people still like respond to your input and everything. It has keyboard, mouse, and game support, which is really, really cool. People can actually hook up USB controllers now, and you can play a game in Firefox with that. Um, and all you have to do to draw on it is use the canvas tag and some JavaScript. Um, it's not nearly as intimidating as you think. Um, a bunch of us built a game. Uh, if you guys have internet here, you can see these as examples. But a bunch of us on my team built a game in an afternoon that's basically a Mario in um, Maybe after my talk, I'll actually go to this page. I'll load it up on that old machine. I hate breaking out of keynotes uh, in the middle of it. Um, but we built a state clone, my boss and I, in an afternoon, because we had a hack day with a bunch of interns. It turned out they were way smarter. We were going to go and like, teach them how to do web programming. But they did all this cool shit anyway. So we were like, well, what are we going to do? Maybe we'll try to make a game. And we actually thought, we're going to try to make a game and we're going to fail. 
turns out we actually built this like snake game. We made it work on the iPhone with touch events. I was in Brazil last month when we were doing a hack day, and this guy built a Palm game for phones. Okay, it doesn't sound that exciting. What he did was he built a no, he did this in an afternoon. He built a Node.js server. And built this up on the client side, and two phones, iOS, Android, Firefox OS, whatever. I mean, you worked on a desktop. It was a little weird doing because I'm quoting a website. You took a phone out and you played Pong, and as soon as it got to the top of the screen, went to the other person's phone and then knocked it back. We did this in an afternoon because of the stuff that he already had from his own that games and stuff. So he was like, I don't know anything about collision detection. I don't know anything about animation moves, but the code is really well commented. It's all there. And it's basically a jumping off point. We built not only Palm, but like cross-platform Node.js or Palm in three or four hours. It was totally mind-blowing. This Flux game that we have here, it's a Mario clone. Or it's more like Contra, I guess, like where you shoot a gun and you attack enemies and all this stuff. Um, it's got sound. It's got you know background music and everything. Four or five people built it in a day. Um, yeah. like it's since been hacked on and changed around, but uh, it's really easy to get started with. So. And it's not just Mario style games. Like these games are again, they're not just new apps of games where it's like, well, it's kind of interesting and neat, but it's not really that exciting. Uh, you can take games in web browser. This is really, really crazy. So this is kind of odd to include a talk and a talk, but uh, it's the best demo I have of this. So Brandon Knight, you know, he's our CTO, he wrote JavaScript, so you may love or hate him, but um, hey, whatever. Uh, so this is him demoing. This uh, game engine. Um, there's an audio that goes with this, but this uh, is actually running in a web browser with no Flash installed, with no uh, Java installed, anything. It's using WebGL, which is you know, something that's in, I think, Chrome 14, Firefox 11 or 12. It's in a lot of major browsers, and it's only even work on Firefox OS phone or work on a lot of mobiles. And it's, it's written with JavaScript. It turns out that it was written in C, and there's this thing that ports C code to JavaScript. Mm. That's insane. But um, this was like a kind of a up on it. It works with JS, it works with uh, WebGL. And you can build these kinds of games that run. This is running at 60 frames per second. You can see that here, 59. But this is running on someone's computer inside a browser. And it's, you know, these graphics are. Call of Duty style. They're not you know, built by a company that has millions of dollars. But if you had millions of dollars, you could put this game on the web. And instead of going, oh, okay, well, we really want to make a Mac port, but we have to pay that you know that one company that does Mac ports of all the games, Asper or something. Um, we could pay them a million dollars to do it, or hundred thousand dollars a year or something. Or you could just write it for the web. Um, it's pretty cool, and you can actually take existing C and C plus plus game library to game code and translate it into JavaScript. So there's this huge plethora of stuff that I don't understand because I stopped doing C development 10 years ago or whatever. Um, like, you can now just get it in JavaScript. Uh, it's really actually quite exciting. Nice. Um, so yeah, this stuff also works on mobile, these, uh, these web apps. Um, this is my iPhone, the picture of my former motorcycle. It was stolen. It's that. Um, but this uh, servant game, this snake game that we wrote, to get it to work like a, an app on iOS, so it has its own home screen icon, and it works in the multitasking training game, it's like. And stuff. Um, so all this stuff is basically already got through. I'm basically just trying to tell you that you should write games because it's totally not as hard as you thought. And I will show you this uh, little demo after. Um, it's just a kitten break. This <laughs> kitten's are really cute. I've been talking for a while, so I figured you'd like that. Um, those must be really, really young kittens or really huge cups of coffee. <laughs> Um, okay, so you can write a game, write it HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the client side. That's really cool. It runs on a phone, it runs on a computer. We provide you all the parts to build the thing. 
can give you Firefox and Chrome, Spectre, whatever you want to use. You can test it the game, play with JavaScript. How do you actually put it somewhere? The cool thing about iOS and Android, it's basically a little package and they host it for you and they get to put it on the phone. Well, we can have packages and stuff too. You just have to tell the browser to install it with stuff like AppCache and mobile storage, right? You say, okay, these are all my resources. That snake game that I have, the, the circuit thing, works totally offline. I actually have it installed on my phone. Um, it's a bad example because my phone is unlocked and I have data. So you have to trust me that it works. But uh, I've got it installed in my little games folder here. And uh, you probably can't see it. But I play it on the subway in Montreal. So like, I'll be getting on the subway and I use my data connection. I can actually play this game that's written entirely in HTML. Um, the easiest way to deploy this stuff is actually on GitHub. Um, I don't know how many people here use GitHub for development, show of hands. OK. Um, so GitHub has this really cool feature. GitHub, for those of you who don't know or don't use it or whatever, just get hosting site that totally kicks ass. Um, they're really, really nice guys, and they have a really nice interface. And it's free for open source projects, and it's reasonably cheap uh, for non-open source projects. Um, but obviously, you can push yourself forever. Uh, GitHub has this really cool feature called GitHub Pages, where you push to a Git repository, it will post the contents of that Git repository on their servers for free, and they are bigger than you, they can handle the scale. The cool thing about that is if your open web app is just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that you mm. put in the Git repository to manage it, you can tell GitHub to then push that stuff onto a server, and then someone can go to that server. It will download to their phone or their desktop machine. And they basically just host your app for you, and then doing continuous deployment for you. So every time you update, you're like, OK, my test pass, I'm going to check this into Git, I'm going to push it. That automatically pushes it to their hosted server, and then someone just gets your updates for free. So we actually encourage people to do this in our mortar uh, web app template that we ship out to people. We say, by default, you're probably just going to, going to focus on GitHub, and we even have a command that you can run that says, I'm going to check this out to a different branch, push it up to that hosted branch on GitHub, you know, file all the assets and everything before I do that, and I put it in and then play it up for you. Uh, so you can actually do this without even having to know that you can get through a like, Check out this separate branch, but then minify these things, but then don't ignore that Git is really confusing. Um, but it'll do all this for you. So that's pretty cool. Um, you need a server, which is probably common for games. Think of stuff like high scores, leaderboards, some kind of like matchmaking system. Um, I don't know of any games that will play on a date, but I can get them to play against my friends or whatever. So you go, okay, I want to be able to play against you know, somebody random or somebody that I know based on an email address or something. We have little Node.js servers that you can deploy to Heroku for free or a Lino for a little bit of money. Um, and they, they all actually have some of the stuff built in, basic leaderboard capabilities and uh, the kind of matchmaking services and stuff. So you have a game that has an interactive component. I don't know if you hear like plays Letterpress on the iPhone, and it's lost hours for that. But um, yeah, stuff like that, we can actually give you even servers to use. Um, and obviously, if you have a marketplace, one of the big things is like making money when you make games. I said earlier, they are a huge part of the iOS uh, app store sales. Right? So people are making a shit ton of money on this stuff. Um, Mozilla Marketplace will host your apps and will even have a payment system. So I don't know which countries it's going to be rolled in first, I imagine Brazil. Um, but you can go ahead and put your stuff on here and you can charge money for it. So, the point of what I'm talking about is this kind of shit shouldn't belong to EA and even the indie game developers who write stuff on iOS or Mac or whatever. I think a lot of web developers feel like the kind of stuff we can write is like social things, social works really well on the web because. Everyone has access to a web device, so social is a natural fit for that, right? Facebook, you can kind of be everywhere because everything is well connected and you can all find HTML. Um, and productivity is a really big thing. Because, you know, like stuff like email and Basecamp and chat systems and all that kind of stuff, it just translates well to the web because everyone has a web enabled device. Well, everyone has a game enabled device if they have a web enabled device now. So let's stop. Going, let's build to do apps and our SS readers, and even really simple, silly games that we don't put any thought into. We can make real cool, real interesting games, Zelda's and Mario's and all that kind of stuff with web technology. So I think it's 
about like when you're a kid or an adult, or if you're like me, an adult who's basically still five years old in his brain. Um, if you ever want to write a game, you now should. You shouldn't feel intimidated by it anymore. And the web can totally take this market and do a lot of fun stuff with it. And Mozilla has a bunch of tools. Uh, I wanted to walk through that those tools exist. I have a, a link in my slide that points you to all of these games and all the stuff we built it with. All of the games that I was talking about today are open source. Um, so you can go ahead and look at our code and see what we've done. And then put your own graphics and your own story and your own physics in um, and make really awesome stuff. So if you want to learn more about me, this is Tokyo Matt everywhere. Um, you can hit me up on Twitter after this. If I left something out or if you think of something later, if you want to send me an email, I will totally reply to it. Um, and if you want to talk about games or building games or who do you can talk to at Mozilla who knows way more about it than I do, um, I'd be more than happy to hook you up with them. And uh, please ask me questions about all those kind of stuff. Who has questions about building games in a web browser? Yes. Well, uh, I'm quite excited about uh, games and web browsers, but no great examples. Yes. There's no great examples. Uh, like, I mean, should, you should be able to deliver something in the browser. The, the one thing I wanted to say is Planetarium. Do you remember that game about seven, eight years ago? It was like a massive online thing on this. Is it, maybe it was only big in Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's like a, a like a, like a, it's a turn-based game where you just like, I'm going to build an, air, uh, an aircraft or something like that. And then the next turn, you will attack with the aircraft. It was very simple. It was like a, it's like a BBS door game if you if you're as old as I am. Uh, that would be a cool game. So there is a really cool example game. Um, I don't I think it's still running. It's still running. Okay, so he knows what I'm talking about. Um, I will add it to the link at the end of my talk. There's a website up already that has like links from this talk. I will add this in. I should have already. Something called the browser quest. So it's pretty easy to remember. Oh. But Browser Quest is an HTML5 massively multiplayer RPG. So think you know, World of Warcraft or something like that. It's built entirely in HTML5. It is built mostly or uh, cheaply or all by Mozilla. It's hosted on some Mozilla infrastructure. And it's like this 2D game that's sort of Legend of Zelda style, where you walk around and you feed wow. goblins, and you're like a knight in shining armor, and get more <laughs> items and upgrades and stuff. And you are playing with web sockets against a shit ton of other people. So this game launched, and we started like, hammering the servers because it got so bad. Mozilla employees were internally testing it out, but then it got posted on like Hacker News or whatever. And people were just on it and going crazy. So there are cool examples of something that's much more full fledged. Um, I do have links to some of them. Uh, I don't, when, at my, my team, we never built something that was sort of start to finish as, as polished even as like a Mario 1 game. It's because it's our, we don't get paid for our games. I'm sure we get it, but it's kind of not that sweet of a job. Um, but Browser Quest is a really good example of the kind of stuff you can do with this. There's audio. There's you know controls that work on keyboard and mouse. Uh, there's interaction with other players in real time. Like if you load up Browser Quest on one machine, and your friend is in another machine, you sit next to each other, you can go, you can chat with them, you can see it come up on each screen. So there are examples of this stuff um, that are much more knowing than you know, if you built a clone of that shitty game that's on everyone's cell phone, the snake game. Um, there's really cool stuff. Uh, and it's open source, actually. So if you go to github.com slash mozilla slash browser quest, which I think is the URL, I'll put up again, I'll post it at this top. You can go there and you can how we build this game. All the graphics, all of the sound stuff, all of the control stuff, even the WebSocket stuff in terms of how to do efficient real-time communication between players in the game that scales to hundreds, if not thousands, of simultaneous users. So there are real-world examples of this kind of stuff. Um, I think that's what makes it exciting. This uh, 3D game engine, I needed the sound because I didn't want the sound like on my laptop. Something called Banana Bread. It is, again, an open source port of the 3D engine that works in JavaScript and WebGL, um, it plays in the browser. And it really is there. And you can go download that code, run it on your machine, or go to a website, click launch, play this game full screen, audio, and game that's So um, the resources are there. Yeah, Brent, it's not working so well. 
Um, yeah, it should be noted the 2D stuff on a phone is still a little sketchy and battery draining. Pretty right there. Uh, but the 2D stuff works really, really well. And I think on a phone, the 2D stuff is, is where a lot of people spend time anyway, right? Like I know there's like June for the iPhone, but no one wants to put like a two gigabyte Call of Duty game in their iPhone. Angry Birds are awful. Also, in terms of performance, uh, is it The same game is an obscenely simple example, uh, but I, I, mean, I play that on my phone and it never picks up the number stalls and the touch events are really fast. It feels, when I boot it up, it feels no different than me booting up a dialogue game. Um, we've, we've done some more complex platformers on there, just some tests. I've seen browser quests run on mobiles, but I think the touch event support was hacked in, so I forget how well it works, but I've seen pretty complex stuff written in HTML run on a phone. Um, which is something the iPhones have really good processors. So, the next reason we go through is probably the first step that I said that CSS. So, what's something to do with the system? Yeah, so right. Uh, okay, so the question is you write something in, in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, what prevents someone from stealing it? Going it down to these resources and playing the game. Um, so the Mozilla Marketplace uh, has a payment system that includes something called JSON web tokens, uh, which the technical nature of which is slightly over my head because I don't work on it directly, and it's supposed to be kind of complicated because it verifies payments. Uh, but it's a system for someone to at least say, when you go and load this web page. Do you have something installed on your machine that would be cryptographically signed, linked to some kind of account you have that lets you play in this game? Um, obviously, if you did some kind of online JSON web you know, marketplace checking thing every time someone loaded a game, that wouldn't work very well for something that's supposed to be offline. Um, so maybe you do that every once in a while. Um, some amount of it is you trust people not to do that. Um, Android games are pirable. Um, very easily. You can go into an Android file system on a phone and take the APK out and then put it somewhere. And people who make web apps uh, that you pay money for, you know, they have ways around like verifying, making sure you're paying your stuff. Ultimately, I think the answer to the question is it's impossible to stop piracy. So there are certain measures. I mean, you obfuscate code and you check to make sure someone's paid for your app the first time they load it. Um, Maybe there's other things you can do that I don't know about, but I don't focus on that kind of stuff because I know how easy it is to fire the software. Right? I was 14 once and wanted to use Photoshop, and I went and I downloaded it. So I think if we invest a lot of our time worrying, will people pay for this stuff? Game piracy, particularly, is very random, right? Because a, a lot of kids have jailbroken iPod touches that they get hacked in your phone. There's no but what's the thing from the Firefly movie? You can't stop the signal or something. It, there's no way to stop that, ultimately. Um, but I think there are some systems set up around the marketplace and those little hands and stuff that would say, this is maybe you know, linked to some account that you have that you bought apps in the marketplace for. We're going to verify that you bought it. Um, but I've listened to guys who work on iOS apps. They put a lot of time and effort into doing piracy checking, right? And going like, Here's all these extra ways, even if someone's a jailbroken iPhone and got my app and put it on their phone to check to see if they pirated it, those pirates get for one step ahead. So I hope we're not investing a lot of resources in that. Because to me, it's going to be a 
I think that the goal is to make it non-trivial. Yeah, and that's that's the trick, right? And then you get most of the way there, and then after that, you can spend most of your time with the capital asset. Yeah. If you if the desktop software has to solve yeah, if you have a game that is network enabled, you know, um, and even if that's something that has like a leaderboard, or you can do like a simple, you know, make sure this person bought it, kind of check it once in a while. I think that's where you should be at. And if you write something that's totally client side, you want people to pay for it, and someone ends up hiring it, I mean, I don't know. In that particular case, I really hope Carmen exists and like gives them a swift kick in the ass. But there's not a lot of LC you can do. It's a valid concern. I think I think one of the more interesting concerns is like two these games are built with JavaScript. How do you write people from like hacking them and doing leaderboard stuff, right? And being like, oh, I got this game, and um, this is where stuff like Fire JS and really modular systems comes into play. Um, and you're designing these apps, and stuff we ship is all like Fire JS, very modular stuff, and exposed to window objects. Um, and so where someone can just go into the console and really easily say. I'm going to turn my score into 9 billion and then submit it to the leaderboard. And something tells you that is in the first place in every single Mozilla game that exists. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's some actual stuff in our coming practices to make it best easy to hack these games too. But that's something I really like. Just like, oh, you can go in and screw up the game. Any other questions about building Mario for Firefox? Any of your frameworks that you use? Frameworks that we use. So for Git, right? No, 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 no. Passe, bootstraps, passe. Yeah, actually, interestingly enough, the guys who work on bootstrap left Twitter. And it, more interestingly enough, one of them thought he could get into Brazil with an Argentinian visa. So I wouldn't trust those guys for being that smart. He got stuck in the airport. Uh, okay, I'll check out his question. Any game specific right. frameworks? Game specific frameworks. So, there aren't a lot of game-specific frameworks in terms of how we as web developers would think of them, right? Because we often think of stuff like Backbone or Ember or even something like jQuery Mobile or jQuery Y or something. Um, it's still a bit of an early phase, but we have our, our templates and sort of like reference games. Um, so the, the web game stuff, the stuff, the stuff that comes with that, is a really good starting point to look into how do you do collision detection? How do you do pieces of a game? We don't have a really good web game framework yet, and I'm not sure if we ever will just because a lot of gaming frameworks tend to be more about the rendering stuff, right? How do you draw stuff? And for us, that's Canvas and JS, and it's not hard to solve. But there are a lot of frameworks. There's actually a couple in the, the link I have in terms of how do you do good keyboard event binding, right? How do you do even like games, gamepad uh, binding? How do you do um, audio visually? Pardon? Physics. Physics, yes. Yeah. So box, a box JS, which is a part of the box 2D or whatever, like a physics engine. Uh, there are actually JavaScript physics engines for doing stuff like uh, Mario. There's also ones for doing more like advanced 3D manipulations and stuff. Those all exist. Um, uh, I would say send me an email if you really want to. I'll try to put some more in my talk afterward, but I don't have a good collection of them offhand. I can climb off a couple, like Box.js is a really good example of a physics engine ported to JS that exists in C already. But what you'll find for doing gaming is something a bit different than kind of full stack frameworks like a, even Bootstrap. You'll find some web You're going to find more little pieces that you put together that all work together, but you won't find a good framework because Instead of building a Mario game framework, someone will just build a Mario game and rip it off. Like that's what we'll do. Really. Um, the Flux game um, that, that I have as demo here. There's a level editor for that. Like it's a separate web page, and you go in and you draw stuff, and it spits it a JSON blob of different objects in the level, and then the map level editor it like loads it up, and that's how you play the game. I'd say just if you want to make a Mario game, just go with that and just rip it off, and like improve the physics and improve the perfection. And, that's how I do it. Um, so yeah, more about just taking games that already exist. It's just games. Yeah, it's, 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 it's actually it's remarkably easy to write these games. I have never written a game before I had done either of these things. Um, we had one guy who worked at EA as an intern, helped us with the Mario stuff game. So he 
a little bit about like efficient collision detection and, and doing some of these things efficiently. But we got into a room. We're like, we're going to make Mario, and we have nothing to go on. And again, in an afternoon, or in, a, in you know, a bit less than a day, we have this thing that had like sound controls and all this the different levels and like power ups and the game over and it's like wah, wah, wah. Like it was really, it was a long time. And there's no reason that in a month you couldn't build something that people wanted to buy. Okay. Uh, just so you know what I'm talking about when I say flux game. I'm actually going to try to bring it up here. Um, so, yeah, motorcycle articles. Does anyone here ride a motorcycle? A scooter is cool too. I like that Okay, watch for Yeah, I know, I know. I'm trying to bring it up on the screen. So it's a little weird. There's some really weird sound effects in this. All right, here we go. So I have a little gun. I can jump around. Um, you'll notice I can jump once, but if I get the Sneaker, I can jump again. I can shoot these enemies. I get damaged. Um, there's a, a second level. Uh, this guy, actually, he splits into two enemies. Let me do this again. Some of the sound effects were really odd. I didn't catch it in time. Oh. Yeah, he turns into separate ones. You have to jump up to kill them. This like teleports me to another place. So that I can fall off the screen. <laughs> see what this see what this spells. Um, there's actually a level editor that I go here. So I can load this up and I can like paint things on the screen. Uh, this is going to be a little hard because it needs more resolution than the, the thing can provide. But what all this is, if I scroll down, yeah, cool. Okay, so this is how the level is made. Yeah. It's just a JSON file, a bunch of stuff, right? It's just super simple. But up here is a canvas. Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. So I can paint these little things. I click on a thing. I just paint it on here, and it changes the JSON output. What's actually really cool is you can create <coughs> JSON text that you save to a file and paste it in here, and it will update this. So I mean, like, this is kind of end-to-end -end how you would build a game, both in terms of the engine, but also building levels and all the the levels are just a JSON file that says, like, level one. This is where you start. This is where some enemies are. And then this is a big blob of, you know, what objects go where. Um, even the code behind it, like, I don't want to show you code on slides. But in terms of the code behind it, it's really simple. You just kind of have a, a thing that checks every object in the page once a frame, which hopefully is 60 seconds, or no, 60 of seconds, as you mentioned, the last. Um, just says, like, what should I do? Like, should I move my X and Y coordinates back and forth? Because those monsters, you just kind of walk until they hit something. It's going to fire off, like, oh, this object touched this object. And then turn them around. And then if they get shot by something, do this. Um, the, the code is really remarkably simple. Um, and again, all this took an afternoon. In terms of what you're doing here, you're just responding to quick events, like you've always done in JavaScript, and then adding something, right? Going, where does this exist on a canvas? And what tile would that be? And then change that tile's value. Um, a lot of the stuff inside the game is pretty similar too. It's really not that different from responding to like people's form clicks in JavaScript, you know, uh, key movements or something. 
except you're playing with a canvas instead of an HTML text. Um, really, when you're talking about game programming, you don't even have to get HTML and uh, CSS. As a matter of fact, go back here and you look at the HTML. This is the HTML for that. That's it. And it actually injects a canvas tag into here. But most of the HTML is just for giving your controls and turning the sound on and off. Um, it's pretty cool. Any other questions? God, God that was a one. <laughs> oh, yes? Can you turn on the camera? Can I turn on the camera? Um, yes. I, this game is not a camera support. Uh, but uh, get user media, or whatever it's called, that it, there's an API for getting like uh, video and audio and photos at the person's camera. Um, um, there's also probably a specific web API for it in Firefox OS, or maybe it just uses get user media. But uh, window.navigator.getUserMedia allows you to get uh, basically stuff from someone's camera or microphone, right? And video and uh, pictures. So if you wanted to have a game that involved uh, using cameras for stuff, or even you know, to be like upload your photo on the leaderboard, yeah, you can do that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I'm not demoing any of this here because I want to talk about games specifically. But on Firefox OS, and it worked on Firefox for Android, and now, because iOS 6 supports it, even if it's on mobile Safari, we've done JavaScript only Instagram plugins. So, using mm. web workers and Canvas, file APIs, camera upload, um, you can now write like, an Instagram clone that is very performant and does all the kind of stuff Instagram would do using, again, sort of JavaScript and Canvas, and then saving it to the file. Um, and we have stuff like this on GitHub. Again, send me an email. I will show you the link. Um, but if you want to use cameras, yeah. Um, basically, any API you can think of. So like, there's a migration API. There's also the um, like accelerometer APIs and stuff. Uh, if you have a game where you're like, you want to, this is this game where you hold the phone, and you kind of move the die, and you like move the physics. If you want to do something like that in HTML5. You can do it uh, as long as there are APIs that exist. And if the APIs don't exist, like Jeff was saying, we try to check standard ones and say, what well, there is a wrong API in HTML? We have a, one that's kind of spec code. It works on our platform's phone, but standardize it. So the aim is to be able to do all the kind of stuff you can do natively in HTML. That's really the big takeaway here I hope, is that this stuff is not out of the region. Um, a lot of browser vendors are. And a lot in mind. HTML is a serious gaming platform, especially for casual gaming, which is basically like all of mobile gaming and where a lot of money is. Um, HTML5 would totally fit that bill. Uh, it doesn't have to be written in iOS anymore. 